Amen. Thank you, Gina. I appreciate her and all that she does. Um, Gina was here when I first came, almost 15 years ago. So um, she has been so faithful to use her musical talents and, and be involved with our, our teenagers and just whatever, whatever we need her to do, she's willing to do it. So thank you so much. Well, this morning we start our second installment in our walk through Mark the God who is active, and we're talking about getting the message out today. And So if you'll turn to Mark chapter 1, uh, I'm going to read from uh, verses 14 through 20, Mark 1, 14 through 20. And so if you'll stand with me, please, I'll read aloud. You follow along in your copy of the Scripture. Mark 1, beginning in verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their net and followed him. When he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after them. Heavenly Father, we thank you, uh, Lord, that we are able to gather here this morning and each Sunday morning to lift up your name in song, Father, to pray together corporately, or to fellowship with one another, to read and study your word. Lord, we are so blessed to be able to do that, we thank you. We thank you for your presence here this morning. Lord, we thank you for your love and your grace toward us. And pray, Father, that you would be with us as we look at this text today. As we come together and we uh, partake of the Lord's table this morning, Lord, may you be honored and glorified in all things. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Three things I found in this text that I wanted to share with you this morning. And first of all, the first thing is in verses 14 to 15, it's the proclamation. The proclamation, Christ came uh, proclaiming a message. In verse 14 and 15, it says, Now after John was put in prison, that would be John the Baptist, by the way, uh, not John the, the Apostle, not the one who wrote the Gospel of John, but this is John the Baptist. You, uh, some call him John the Baptizer. It was, he was Jesus' cousin is who he was. He was about six months older than Jesus. And uh, this is who, and he, was, he had been preaching and preparing the way for Jesus to come. We talked about him some last week. And, uh, but he, he got to preaching against the, uh, Herod the leader, and he didn't like that. And so Herod put him in prison. Eventually, and we're going to see, he, he uh, gets... Uh, beheaded for that, but uh, right now he was just in prison. So after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, and here was his proclamation, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The time is at hand. In other words, Jesus was saying, the time has come. It is fulfilled for the kingdom of God to come to earth. Galatians 4.4 4 says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. Everything had been set up. It was all ready to go. And at this point, the time had been fulfilled for Jesus to start His earthly ministry. It says, The kingdom of God is at hand, Jesus said. Jesus is uh, Himself, His God in the flesh. One of the names ascribed to Him by Scripture is Emmanuel, which means God with us. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you go down to verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh. So God became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. So this is Jesus Christ saying the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, he's declaring since he is God and he is the King of kings, his kingdom had come to earth with him on the scene. And the kingdom of God there, it was both present and it was future. It was here, but it was still coming. 
In other words, the kingdom of God was begun with Jesus' life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, but it's not complete yet. Jesus Christ's kingdom, the kingdom of God, will not be complete until he comes again and returns for his people. And we are with him forever and ever and ever. And then the kingdom of God will be complete at his triumphant return. But the only way to enter that kingdom is what Jesus says next. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. The word repent simply means to turn around. The picture is this, I'm traveling this way, I'm going away from God, I'm going towards sin, I'm living life my way, I'm doing things the way I want to do them, not giving God a second thought, I don't really, don't really care what he thinks or what he wants me to do, I'm going my own way. And then perhaps I encounter someone who, who proclaims the gospel to me, whether it's a friend who, who lives a different lifestyle than I do, and, and they they come to me and say, you know, I, I love you and I care about you. I want you to know about this Jesus Christ that I know. Or maybe they invite me to church. Or maybe I turn on the TV and I, and I hear this, this TV preacher or someone pro, uh, proclaiming the gospel. Or, or uh, somebody shows up and knocks at my door and, and hands me an invitation, wants to invite me to their church. And, and I come and I hear the gospel message and it's proclaimed to me. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then the Holy Spirit begins to work and stir in my heart as I'm still walking away from God. And it comes a point where I believe that message. And then I turn around. And now I'm walking toward God. Walking away from myself, away from my sin, away from living life on my terms. I am now living for God. That's repentance. And repentance and belief in the gospel uh, happen so quickly that you can barely differentiate between the two. And the gospel is God's message that I, a sinful man, in walking away from God, I am headed towards certain destruction. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if I, as I'm walking uh, in my sin, uh, in, in my way, walking away from God, the Bible says the punishment for that is death. It says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. When I believe, when I turn, I repent, and I start heading toward God, now I am His child. I am walking his way. I'm living my life for him. He says, I have eternal life. And that's the gospel, that Jesus Christ came. He lived. He died in my place. The death he died on the cross, I deserved. But he took it for me. He was buried and he came back to life. The resurrection, what we celebrated on Easter a few weeks ago. That is the gospel message. So Jesus says to repent and believe in the gospel. When we do that, we have entered the kingdom of God. And today we're observing the Lord's Supper. When we do that, we're, we're remembering all of Jesus' proclamation. What he said, it, Jesus is the fulfillment of God's hope. The time is at hand. The time is fulfilled. It, it's, it's his kingdom that we become part of when we repent and believe in the good news of his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And as we do that, as we come to this table and remember by uh, partaking of the Lord's Supper, not only do we remember his death, burial, and resurrection, but we also anticipate his triumphant return. We're here today to celebrate Christ's proclamation. But we as believers in Jesus Christ are also called to be part of the mobilization. In verses 16 and 19, we see Jesus begins assembling his group of disciples. In verse 16, he meets two guys by the name of Simon and Andrew. Simon, another name you may know him by, is Peter. Simon Peter. 
and his brother Andrew. Remember last week I told you that Mark is a man's book, so he doesn't, he doesn't bog you down with a lot of details trying to get straight to the point. Well, if you read Matthew's account and Luke's account, you'll see that, uh, that there's a little more detail in there in Simon Peter and Andrew getting to know Jesus. And Andrew was actually the one who introduced Peter to Jesus. And then you go on down to verse 19, and, and Jesus meets two more guys, two brothers. It says, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. They have a nickname, by the way. As you read through Scripture, you find out they're known as the Sons of Thunder. Sounds like they should be a big-time wrestling duo. Yeah. WWE, there you go. Anyway, let's move on. This is a long time ago. In the time that Jesus walked the earth, Generally, what happened, if, uh, if someone saw a, a teacher who they wanted to study under, they approached the teacher and applied to, to be one of their disciples. Jesus did things a little differently, if you haven't gotten that already in your study of his life. And instead of waiting for people to approach him and want to, to be his, his disciples, Jesus began assembling his own team, and he began uh, uh, picking people and asking people to come and follow him. Simon and Andrew, James and John. He found them, said, hey, I like this team. I'd like you to be on my team. Come, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Now, now, when he did this, when he began assembling his team, Jesus didn't look at the obvious candidates. He didn't go to the, to the local Jewish school or the local uh, synagogue and start picking out the guys who knew the Scripture the best. Jesus picked normal, common, Galilean fishermen. Hard-working, blue-collar guys. Just regular Joes. Now, what in the world was he thinking? You know, I, I think Jesus was... Simply following God the Father's example. Jesus being God in the flesh, he's just doing what he's always done. Whenever God has chosen to do something awesome, many times in Scripture when you look, he chooses the most unlikely of people to do it. Look at Abraham. You read about Abraham in Hebrews, in that, that whole, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith we like to call it. It says, and Abraham, a man as good as dead, he was 99 years old. An angel showed up and said, Abraham, you're going to be a daddy. <laughs> he said, you're crazy. I'm too old. Can't do it. But God chose him, and Abraham became the father of many nations. At 100 years old. He had a son, Moses. The scripture describes him as a, a man slow of speech. It could have been, a, a, some people believe it, it may have been a, a speech impediment, and, and some even believe that, that he had a, uh, a condition uh, that he, where he stuttered real badly. And, and he didn't want to speak to Pharaoh because of his problem. That was his excuse anyway. But God chose him to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. David, the youngest of Jesse's sons, just a young shepherd, hanging out in the field. When, when Samuel came to anoint uh, one of Jesse's sons as uh, the next king of Israel, Jesse didn't even bother to call David in because surely it wouldn't be him. But that's the one that God chose to be the king of Israel. Jonah. Jonah ran from God's purpose. He knew what God wanted him to do. And he ran away from it, and God chased him. I don't know if you've ever had God chase you before, but Jonah found out the hard way you just don't do that. And he got on a ship, started going the opposite direction of the way he was supposed to go. God had prepared a fish for him because he knew what, was Jonah, what Jonah was going to do. And, and the guys, Jonah told the guys, if you want to get rid of me, uh, this storm, you're going to have to throw me overboard. So they did, and the fish swallowed him up, took him over to where he was supposed to be, spit him out. Three days in the belly of a fish. Can you imagine? You're going to need some deodorant after that. All right. But even then, 
Jonah was reluctant. He didn't want to deliver the message that God had given him for the Ninevites. God had delivered, said, said this message, said, because of your evilness, I'm going to destroy you in 40 days. And Jonah knew. Jonah knew that if, if by chance they happened to repent of their sin and not do it and start worshiping the Lord, that God would spare them. And that's exactly what happened. Jonah delivered the message to the Ninevites. God relented his hand. He didn't destroy them immediately. Fast forward several years, and it happens, but they went back to their wicked ways. And Jonah said, I knew it. See, I told you, God. I knew that's what you were going to do. But Jonah still delivered his message. Elizabeth, a barren woman, advanced in age, gave birth to John the Baptist, the one who would prepare the way for the promised Messiah, Mary little teenage girl. Some people estimate that she was no more than 15 years old when she gave birth to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Nobody would have expected that. But God chooses people who are unlikely. Dear one, if you think that God cannot use you, let me assure you that God has great plans for you. He wants to do great things in you and through you. There are so many ways that God could have chosen to get his message out about salvation. He doesn't need us to do it, but God wants us to do it. And it is a blessing to be God's instrument and to share his life-giving message with those who need to hear it. Won't you be part of the team that God is mobilizing for his glory? You might be sitting there saying, well, you know, I, I just don't have anything to offer. I can't do anything. Perfect. That's exactly what God's looking for. Empty vessels who are just willing to be used by him. And he will take you and he will mold you and he will shape you and he will fill you and he will use you to his honor and his glory. And you will love it to carry out the proclamation, you must become part of the mobilization and then undergo the transformation. Verse 17, 18, and 20, we see uh, something. In 17, Jesus says to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In verse 20, he says, and immediately he called them, talking about James and John, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat and hired servant, with the hired servants and went after him. He says, follow me, I will make you become fishers of men. And it would take Jesus three and a half years to transform these rough fishermen and the other misfits who would join his little band of merry men into world-changing evangelists that we read about in the book of Acts, with the exception of Judas. Essentially, Jesus put the disciples through his own type of seminary. One with uh, lots of hands-on experience. One with moments, many moments, I am sure, of very frustrating times when Jesus' agenda would not line up with the disciples' expectations. I don't know about you, but I have those moments quite often. Lord, if you would just do this, this way, then you know, things would go a lot smoother, I'm sure. And of course, my way is always... Uh, a little less fulfilling than God's way. But it, it happens. And there are times that you might think, why isn't life going my way? Particularly for some of you new believers and, and many of us old believers as well, we, we think this way. We think, you know, Lord, why isn't, God go, why isn't life going the way I think it should? I'm living my life for you. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm trying to do the right thing. Why isn't life going the way I want it to? Why are my friends treating me badly? 
Why doesn't my family understand this new way of life that I have, this newfound faith? God, what is going on? Let's look at the children of Israel as an example. Children of Israel spent 400 years under Pharaoh's rule and reign. God had used Egypt to save uh, the world from famine and particularly to save the Hebrew children from famine. But they stayed right there in Egypt for 400 years. Generations of children were born in Egypt. And then God sent Moses to deliver them out of Egypt and take them to a land that he had promised Abraham. And don't you know, it was frustrating to many of them. God delivered them miraculously. The, the whole ten plagues thing, the Passover where he, he, he miraculously saved his children and, and took them up, right up to the Red Sea, parted the waters, let them walk through on dry land, drowned Pharaoh's army behind them. What a sight to see. And they get on the other side and they get a little hungry. They start griping and complaining, Moses, you brought us out here to kill us. God provides. They get a little thirsty. Moses, you brought us out here to kill us. I wish we were back in Egypt. God provides water. They gripe and grumble and complain all the way. You look at a map. You see where they started. And then you look at where they finished. Even today, if you were to walk it, it would only take you about two weeks from where they started to where they finished. But they wandered around that desert for 40 years. Makes you wonder why, doesn't it? I believe more than God getting his children out of Egypt, God wanted to get Egypt out of his children before he sent them on to the promised land. They had 400 years of Egyptian culture ingrained in them. 400 years of relying upon Pharaoh and not upon him ingrained in them. He needed them to enter that promised land having confidence and faith in him, knowing that he would go before them, he would destroy their enemies, he would help them conquer that land, and he would help them take it. And they would live there in houses they did not build, eating from vineyards they did not plant. In a land flowing with milk and honey. God had to get Egypt out of his children. He had, they had to be purged before they entered the promised land. They had to be transformed. Paul would later write in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be transformed. Transformation is is what God is doing in the life of the believer. God is in the process of transforming you. He had to do it with the children of uh, Israel. He had to do it with his disciples that he called to follow him, and he wants to do it with you. And sometimes the transformation process is not fun. It hurts. Things come our way that we don't understand. But the word for transformation, the Greek word, is where we get the word metamorphosis from. And that's the process that a caterpillar goes through when he changes into a butterfly. My my wife loves monarch butterflies, and she buys milkweed, and she bought some this this spring and has planted it in our uh, flower bed right at our front walkway, and she's so excited because she looked at it the other day, and there's all these little holes in the leaves, and she said... (gasps) That's evidence there's there's little caterpillars on there. They're going to be butterflies. And she's so excited. We've watched this process before. Uh, The the caterpillars grow and they'll they'll, uh, form a little chrysalis and they'll they'll get inside of it and all this stuff. You know, spin that web around them and they'll, they'll be in their little cocoon and it'll change colors. And then all of a sudden, they'll start coming out. And there's no hurry about the process. When they start coming out, it's, it's very difficult. And the temptation for us as human beings, and, and particularly if you're a compassionate human being, the temptation is for you to want to help the butterfly. 
And so you're tempted to cut the chrysalis. But if you do, the butterfly will come out deformed. And it won't be what God intended it to be. It'll die. So you see, it needs the struggle. It needs the difficulty to push the fluid into the wings and to cause it to come out as beautiful as God intended a monarch butterfly to be. If you try to help it, if you try to spare it the pain, you sentence it to death. Sometimes we need the struggle to be transformed into everything God desires us to be. Sometimes it, it hurts as God transforms us. As Romans 12, 2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, what does that mean, the renewing of your mind? See, when you allow God to take over, he starts changing the way you think. And you have a responsibility in, in that. See, so you have to be careful with what you put into your minds. You have to be careful with what you read. You have to be careful with what you listen to. You have to be careful with what you watch. Particularly today in this, this day of, of instant internet. I mean, you can, you can subscribe to Netflix and you can watch it on your TV. You can watch it on your computer. Watch it on your phone. Watch it on your iPad. Whatever it is, you've got, you, can, you can watch it. Anything that you want, you can continue all these series, you can, you can binge watch. You can start at the house watching on your TV. Jump on the bus, head to school, you're watching it on your phone. Get to school, put the headphone in. I got it, teacher. Thank you. I'm here. And you're watching. You know, don't get any ideas. Right. Anyway. Constant connectivity. But we have to be careful with what we're watching and what we're listening to and what we're reading. The Bible says that for us to think on things that are lovely and pure and good, to think on these things, things that are holy. There are things that Some things we need to say no to. And I know that's hard sometimes. Especially when all of our friends are watching things or listening to certain things or reading certain things. You want to be part of the, part of the group and part of the conversation. But sometimes those things just aren't good for us. We have to be careful with them. And there are some things we need to say yes to. The first step you need to say, uh, first thing you need to say yes to is say, yes, Lord, I want you. When, when you come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, you're saying, yes, Lord, I want you. I don't want to walk my way anymore. I, I don't want to walk toward certain destruction anymore. I want to come toward you. I want to walk toward you. I want you, Lord. And then follow that up with, yes, Lord, I will do whatever you want. Transform my thinking. Change the way I think. I, Lord, I will read your word. I will pray. Lord, I will even pray for those who treat me wrongly. I'll worship you. Lord, I'll worship you in private and I'll worship you in church on Sunday morning corporately with the body of Christ. I will be part of your proclamation. Use me in your mobilization as I experience your transformation. Yes, Lord. Yes. If you would bow with me, please.